look, I want to actually hand out a big bouquet. I, I don't, like many of you, watch mainstream media anymore, uh, let alone the 6 o'clock newses, which can be absolute, um, I don't know, the ultimate woke experience, uh, watching News Hub or watching uh, TV One. But I want to um, say to everyone involved in the first half hour in particular of the Television One News Bulletin, which I watched uh, live online uh, last night, I, I want to say congratulations for conveying through your interviews a a and the video you'd taken an idea of just what has happened, particularly in the Bay of Plenty uh, and the East Cape, what has happened in, you know, at the time of and in the wake of Cyclone Gabriel. It is uh, stark and it is massive. And I don't think there can be any doubt that this is certainly comparable in our lifetimes to what happened in Christchurch, to the Christchurch earthquake in terms of its impact. And I think there is a general feeling um, amongst many people, and I certainly am getting reports of this, that we can expect, alas, a death toll that is going to be much, much higher. And it will take a long time to rebuild the infrastructure in the worst affected areas. And there may, may be long-term tough decisions to be made about whether you, what you do rebuild and where you rebuild it. So it is a massive, massive event. I, I think the most stark pictures I saw last night were of the uh, power substation uh, in Hawke's Bay, just, well, just stuffed, really. Uh, munted, munted uh, would be the word, and the bridges and, and the road access uh, destroyed. Uh, and just great stories about people's pets, people's livestock, some nice stories, but also some... Uh, stories of, of real uh, tragedy and a couple of farmers, a couple of interviews really struck with me, a uh, young farmer who'd had to get his kids and his family out by helicopter uh, and the tears in his eyes and the emotion in his eyes and other people had said, well, we're still alive, we're still here and uh, the toll of this is going to be huge and... I think we're all going to have to chip in. The other thing about that coverage was it made me bloody proud to be a New Zealander and you looked at communities all through the affected areas banding together without central government, without a rule book, getting on with it. And, and they weren't communities that were divided by their race or their ethnicity or their politics. They were Kiwis mucking in and getting on with it and helping each other. Alas, also reports coming through and you heard maybe six generators stolen and reports of rooting, uh, looting, my bad, and, um, and, um, and robbery, well, not robbery, uh, burglary, and just terrible, terrible reports of people, and some say gang-affiliated, and in fact, the police minister called out one gang, he wouldn't, didn't have the balls to say who it was. Criminals taking advantage of these terrible circumstances, uh, and I think we've got to talk about that too. Um, but what struck me is the areas that are hit um, are areas that grow a lot of stuff, farm a lot of stuff, and no matter what you say about people making computer games, farming, the production of primary produce is New Zealand's bread and butter. Uh, and uh, you can't help but think there's some, a real problem down the pike um, in terms of farming. So I thought the best person to kick off with this morning would be head of, well, the organisation that covers farmers across the country, that's Federated Farmers, uh, and their head is Andrew Hoggart. He joins us on the line now. Andrew, uh, welcome to the, to the platform, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks for having me on, Sean. Yeah. Uh, you were actually out of Muxton. You're in the Manawatu, and yet you had some flood damage. I see some pictures yeah. on social media of you clearing a road with your tractor. Yeah, it was actually my old man clearing the road. Uh, <laughs> um, it was something useful for him to do because 74 years of age, he's not that into uh, all the get physical labour. Get out but the tractor, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, we, had, we didn't have the rain here, but the rain obviously fell high up in the ranges. It was just spilling over uh, the Ruahines from east coast. And, yeah, we had a, a flood on our river um, that was comparable to what we had in 2004. Um, so, yeah, our, bottom, our road got covered in silt. Um, 
bridge luckily didn't get washed away, but geez, I'm not sure if it could have taken much more. Um, and yeah, a bit of damage all along the all along yeah. the river boundary with fences to clear and stuff to fix. Yeah. But nothing compared to uh, those scenes we've seen from over on the east coast. So, consider so Andrew, lucky. what what are you guys hearing about just how bad it is? And can you tell us primarily what sort of farming or agricultural production has been, will be, have been affected most? I think, um, without a doubt, the horticulture sector um, down on those. Gisborne Flats, um, oh, sorry, not Gisborne, well, there, there's horticulture in Gisborne as well, um, but also in the Hawke's Bay, um, I think those orchards, um, th- I would think they're going to be the hardest hit. That's their entire year's sort of um, income that they were about to harvest not too long away and gone, and it's going to take them years to rebuild. Um, you know, with cattle, you know, it's hard to deal with these sort of things, but you can you can move the cows to paddocks that do have grass that aren't silted up. You can get feed in. You can keep them going. Um, the worst case scenario, you can ship them off to someone else's farm until everything's sorted, and then you can bring them back. You can't do that with the you know horticultural um, products. Um, you know, if like you can't move them. So I think you know not to minimise the impact on. Or the pastoral sector, um, there's definitely a huge impact there, but horticulture's probably taken an even harder hit. Andrew, what's your feeling for uh, the severity and, if you like, the uh, the quantum of how many properties, how much land has been affected by, by this? Do you think, A, do we think we have a full picture and is the picture going to get better or worse? Um, no, I don't think we've got a full picture, and that's part of what uh, hopefully we'll be getting a handle on this week. Um, we do have, fortunately, we've had a bit of experience with dealing with um, flooding and other natural disasters. So we've got the what we call rural needs assessment forms that um, once we're able to contact people, we'll be sending those out, and they can, uh, you know, give us a scope of where the damage is, how much the severity of the damage is, what help the people need, um, and that'll give us an indication on, you know, what sort of, what, what's required the most, what's needed the most in terms of getting people um, back to farming and back to normality. At this stage, I'd say probably access is the, the major issue. That's um, getting the roads up and going getting the roads up and going because you know there's people out there in some of these cut off areas they're trying themselves to get the access open um but of course they can't get you know they're running short on diesel uh, they mm-hmm. might be running equipment on degenerators um of course that fuel's running down so you know it's getting fuel to them to be able to carry on it's that sort of stuff and, and mm-hmm. connectivity being able to contact the the yeah, wider we're, world. we're going to um, talk about that this morning. Uh, it seems like cell phone and other other infrastructures didn't have any resilience in re- in regards to this. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's said that because that was one of the key things that came. I remember from out of the two thousand and four floods here in Manawatu was a real concern around how you know the communication networks just didn't hold up, and mm. you would have thought. It's something we could have worked on and, uh, you know, things like, you know, my cell phone can work when I hop off a plane anywhere else in the world. Why can't it work when I move between, yeah. um, <laughs> go from a Vodafone tower to a telecom tower? Yeah. Um, we, ne- we need some local roaming in these situations. Mm. Um, Andrew, look, there are going to be other, I don't think it's time, I'll be honest, I don't think it's time to point fingers at anyone about this. It's a time to muck in and, and get on with it and make sure yep. people are safe and, you know, start assessing what's happening and rebuild. Uh, look, there's been some controversy about whether or not, uh, particularly mainstream media, were were, and I think RNZ did a job. It's got a job to do. Do you think people were giving adequate warning that this was coming? Um, and I'd like to say what, what I see and read in social media may not reflect the reality on the ground. I'm sure that your members and farmers and, and people involved in in agriculture across this country, they are pretty careful about being cautious and having risk mitigation in place when they do get a warning of something like like yeah. Gabriel. Yeah, if I recall the sort of messaging I was hearing, 
it was, you know, the big focus was in Auckland again, uh, expecting a ah. repeat of what happened, you know, two weeks back. And, you know, it wasn't, you know, I happened to be talking to uh, some of the board members over in Gisborne and they're telling me about what's being predicted for them. And, you know, that was the, to me, you know, it was pretty scary when they're talking about, hey, we're having this amount of rain predicted for us. So I think... You know, farmers, we naturally always look at weather forecasts, um, and whether it's because we like to whinge about it so much or not, but uh, um, it's so integral to our business. So most farmers possibly were looking at the weather forecast, were working out what what was coming, and, geez, that possibly looks But are looks you bad. saying the mainstream media focus was where their main market is, and that was metropolitan Auckland and the people who lived in Auckland, and maybe they were disconnected while there isn't huge population, the population is as dense on the East Cape, Gisborne, uh, Bay of Plenty, the potential for disaster was actually higher. Yeah, well, I mean, I wouldn't be able to... You know, that was just my personal impression yeah, yeah, where yeah, the focus yeah. was on Auckland. Now, there may have been over in Gisborne East Coast lots of local news um, talking about, hey, this is coming, this is bad, um, I, I don't know about that. I, I know from the farmers over there, they were talking up, hey, this is this is looking quite serious. Yeah. Um, but I, th I think it's, you know, mm. we've just got to be balanced with that news coverage. And, mm. yeah, obviously, we've got one and a half million people in Auckland, um, so it's important to get the message out to them. But mm. there's all these other places as well that, you know, and the warnings were there. Um, but I just, yeah, I, I guess the feeling was probably... It was Auckland probably was preparing for it the most, um, and other places we probably weren't quite preparing for it. Um, yeah, that was just sort of antidotal my personal view from recalling. Uh, the, and it, you know, it wasn't until my old man said to me, "All oh, the the flood warning um, is predicting that we might hit 2004 levels," and I was I just didn't I wasn't even thinking. And that, and that made that you take notice. Trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Andrew, I also got to say, I, I get a horrible feeling of, of foreboding um, as communities that have been totally isolated and cut off are opened up and searches go that, that in terms of the loss of life, we haven't seen the worst of this yet. What is, it, what is the feedback you're getting and what are you hearing? Uh, I haven't heard too much about that. Um, mainly the, the focus is on um, a, getting and you know, trying to contact all of those people, um, you know, get in touch with the people that can't get in touch with over in Gisborne and mm. uh, Hawke's Bay. Mm. And um, the immediate sort of needs around um, access and other issues for the, the, what the farmers are facing and, and trying to deal with those, those immediate concerns and, yeah. Um, yeah, come up with solutions for them. Yeah. Andrew, the other thing we've seen are reports of looting and organised criminal gangs taking advantage of this, uh, this situation. Uh, hey, it's just bloody disappointing on a human level. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, some people have just... It's almost like if they're caught, they should just be old school um, chain no, gang, I, I, a shovel, I, I, No, salt, I've had more than it. that. I've had texts this morning that say we should declare martial law and shoot them. Well, might as well put them to use first and get some roads cleared, quite frankly. All right, but that's damn disappointing, Andrew. And it also seems yeah. to me that that isolated communities who are literally getting together, little towns, there were some great stories on the news last night, little towns just getting together, having a daily meeting, setting up their own roadblocks. Um, but they've got a, you know, unless the police can say, we've got a handle on this, mm. um, who would blame them in some ways for taking the law into their own hands? <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't blame them to be honest. Um, and I think you know that raises a point around the roadblocks. It'd be you know if people don't need to be moving around, um, yeah. stay at bloody home. I know there's lots of people want to help, but sometimes just staying out of the way is the best help you can give in these situations. And once things are settled down, then there'll be the call out for for help for, and it can be done in an organised way. Yeah. Um, you know, we're getting... Oh, like yesterday, I was trying to get stuff down 
to the bottom flats to fix up a few things and there's all these bloody rubber knickers on the road trying to um, yeah. you know, it's down to one lane and they're trying to drive through and here I am in a tractor waving at them that I'm not backing up. Yeah. <laughs> piss off back to town. Yeah, I hear you, Andrew. And I think we do have to be tolerant and also of the massive financial impacts this has. We're talking to Tim Grafton from the Insurance Council a little later in the program, uh, a- Andrew. In general terms, and because I'm not a farmer and I haven't run a farming business, um, do farmers get any of this back? Is this, or is this an act of God? You're not covered for it. Uh, so some stuff I'll, I'll be able to get insurance for. Um, in terms of, uh, I think there's a bit of infrastructure I'll get insurance cover for. Um, you know, the fact I won't be able to the loss in sort of grass growth um, yeah. through silting uh, don't get that back. It, it's mainly sort of the infrastructure. If there are some farms that, um, you know, they're, they're having to dry off now, both in Northland and over in the Hawke's Bay, um, yeah. there is, uh, what do they call it, um, interrupt, business interruption insurance. insurance yeah. um, if you have taken that out, you you will get compensation there. Um but it just depends on what boxes you've ticked in your um, insurance uh, policy and whether, you, you, whether you're covered or not. Um, if you've just only gone for the basics, then you might not. You might yeah. be left to a degree on your own there. Yeah. And, Andrew, I'm sure members, uh, Fed Farmers members from all over the country are helping those affected um, and offering what support they can, huh? Yeah, yeah, um, there's lots of support, uh, offers of support coming in and lots of people wanting to help. Um, and, yeah, I think, I guess my message would be to all those people wanting to volunteer and help, yep, there will be a time when we need you, and um, but we've just got to get things organised first. So um, really appreciate all the offers that everyone's willing to make, um, but... Just don't get upset if you're not called back immediately because it, it might be not be for a couple of weeks it's, until we're ready yeah. ready to rock and roll on that. Hey, Andrew, I thank you for your time and uh, good luck to, to you and all the other farmers who are dealing with it. Um, thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Andrew Hoggard here to Federated Farmers. And during that interview, we got a call from, from, from Robin, who I understand is a farmer and joins us now. Robin, good morning. Where are you calling us from? Good morning, Sean. I'm now living in Okato, but I was farming in the Wangahoo Valley in 04 when that flood happened. Okay, just for, for those who don't know, where is that? You know, give it, give us a, a, a thumbnail sketch of where that is, the Okato Valley. Um, oh, the, the Wangahoo Valley where we were farming yeah. is halfway between Wanganui and Hunterville. All right, okay. So it goes right up through to the mountain there. Yeah. Um, we, we were farming in that valley in 04 when the, the 04 floods happened and, and we lost basically everything except our house that was on a hill. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the cow shed had to be rebuilt, um, fences, pasture was all under silt, et cetera, et cetera. But the main thing, Sean, that, that all happened to us and, and I thought we were pretty well over it. But the, the main thing is nothing has been learnt by the people that are supposed to be looking after this stuff. In what way? The, um, it's been? We, we had no warning whatsoever, the same as these guys, and yet I do know as a fact that the people did have warning from further up the river that it was coming down, and yet we got nothing. Um, the other part is because we're on the wrong side of the river, they wouldn't give us any food parcels or any help because we're in the wrong council. Um, a lot of things, we were isolated from the 16th of February to the 26th of February, no phone, no power, no road, no access. Um, we're in a bad way, just like a lot of people are now. And um, there was basically nothing coming. We mucked in ourselves, all of the people in the valley. Well, that's, the feeling, I, that's the feeling I'm getting um, from what I'm seeing and what I'm reading is that communities, mm. the resilience has to mm. come from within them, not from, from Wellington, not from a bunch of bureaucrats or people running around in day-glow vests. Yeah, the, the, the biggest problems we had, Sean, was when the, the glow vests got into the valley um, and tried to stop us from doing everything that we were doing. And we were managing, we were getting on. But, um, yeah, as I say, there was there was nothing and, and nobody's learnt. We tried to tell people that 
you've got to help these people. You've got to find a way to, to get early warning systems and what have you in place so that people would know what's coming. And they assured us, yes, yes, that was all being done. But here we are 20 years on and exactly the same thing has happened yeah, to well, a lot more hope, people. Yeah, let's hope once the, once the immediate crisis, and as I said, I don't think, think it's quite over yet in terms of the impact of what's happened and, and the scale but let's, no, hope we no, le- let's hope we learn our lessons this time, eh, Robin? I thank you for your call. Um, now, here's an interesting text from Chris. Sean, this cyclone wasn't an act of God as you described it to Andrew. Andrew, I was talking on a legal insurance uh, way. Haven't you heard all the people claiming that human-caused climate change done it? Well, that's interesting, Chris. I, I did a Twitter poll on my Twitter last night. And you say, see, particularly on East Cape and other places, um, what do they call it? Slash. Uh, slash from non-indigenous, non-native forestry plantations seems to have had uh, a massive impact on rivers and waterways. Slash. A- and we know about this problem. It's been talked about particularly, you know, on the East Coast for quite some time. And I wonder how many of those forests would be there uh, if we didn't have the carbon credit scheme. And I also know that... Um, there has been political opposition to clearing or burning off that slash for environmental reasons. And, I, and, I've, and I'll get the results of this to you people later, but my question is maybe, maybe in we haven't thought about the law of unintended consequences and covering our country in pine trees to supposedly buy some carbon credits maybe, had an, maybe was a contributing factor to the severity of a severe weather event. Uh, No one can draw a straight line from climate change to this. It's just not possible. Everything is speculation and theory. But it was a severe weather event. Uh, And maybe the impacts of that severe weather event were made worse by some of the stuff, some of the kind of theoretical stuff we were doing to stop climate change. Uh, Look, to be honest, I don't really care right now if it was climate change or not. There are people hurting, there are people chopped off, there are people who have lost a hell of a lot, and a lot more people, I suspect, have lost their lives. Um, so, you know, maybe we don't get into the climate change on it, but we're going to have a lot of questions, a lot of questions to ask ourselves.